And then you also have what we call those individuals in, in the community uh, who are involved in political organizations, who may have went underground uh, due to political repression, mm -hmm. uh, uh, was involved in uh, activities, underground activities, right? Uh, in my opinion, uh, due to the nature of the repression of the government, uh, for instance, uh, a declared war as had been presented against the Black Panther Party by J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI. Right? Those individuals are what we consider prisoners of war. You know, uh, I have a, a for instance, I like to read something if, if I can pull it out. The statement uh, during the course of trial, actually at the end of trial, right? The judge, when he sentenced us, he made a statement, right, um, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, our, our confinement. Now, I, I just like to read the statement that, that the judge said. I think it's important, in as much as that it's sort of like, during the course of the trial, right, the judge tried to depict uh, that this was a criminal proceeding, right? right. This was not a, a political trial, right. Right, in terms of what the judge wanted to represent to the jurors, right? But after our conviction, and uh, when he was sentencing myself, Herman, and uh, Noah, uh, Albert Washington, right, he made a statement. Right? And I think the statement reflects how he actually knew what we were. Mm -hmm. All right. In the sentencing statement, he said, the court will treat them as men. The court will expect that as men, not as revolutionaries, they know what they did, and they, they are willing to stand up and take the consequences of their actions. Indeed, if this is a war, a war against society, then any revolutionary must expect that society will not just sublimely by, that it will protect itself, that it will take steps to avoid and to punish wanton killing. Every society has that basic right of self-preservation. And that's what we talk about here. If indeed this is a war, and if these defendants have been taking consequences of their having been captured by the enemy. Okay. Yeah. That's a statement from the judge. So, right. generally, he's giving recognition to the fact that we are considered, even in his mind, although he tried to right. not recognize it, that we feel the presence of war. Okay. That there had been a war. Okay. A war against a political organization by the federal government. And we have been captured. I do to that. So. Wow, that's that's really interesting. Yeah, well, see, these are things that CBS <laughs> did not offer to, yeah, nice did not offer to the public. Yeah. Um, okay, um, if you have an ad if oh, oh. do you have an advice um, that you would like to give to activists today, or if you could tell them something, what would you advise them? I advise activists today. I, I would advise them to um, involve the masses mm -hmm. in the movement. Uh, that the, the the struggle itself is a people struggle. Uh, that you must take issues with those issues affecting the community. Okay raise those issues to the magnitude from which people will become responsive to their own existence, mm -hmm. uh, to their own understanding of what really is their relationship to the government. Um, yeah, the advice, the, the advice would be that of ensuring the participation of the community on the masses. Right? Uh, do not find yourself uh, self-serving in their understanding of the politics in which they're involved in. Right, that they are indeed, as we have been called when we in the party, service of the people. Mm -hmm. okay. And that they have to serve uh, the community. And for long as they get the community involved, actively involved in what's going on, then we know that we can raise the consciousness of the community and therefore strengthen the foundation from which when repression comes, when repression comes, and it will come, right, that you would have the support of the community. You have support of the masses in terms of that repression uh, and to try to uh, um, fight against that repression. Uh, so community involvement is important. All activists need to get involved in uh, those struggles, those issues that directly has 
have something to do with the community. I don't care if it's rent control, police brutality, mm -hmm. drugs in the community, um, um, the, the electoral process uh, in terms of politicians. Uh, for instance, like in New York, right? There has yet to be a black mayor uh, in, in uh, New York City. Right? Right. That is an issue that empowers the community. Okay, so, you know, even on too many, right, there's a need to empower the community. By whatever means they can possibly do that. Okay, whether it be the electoral process, and voters reg registration, mm -hmm. um, or uh, demonstrations uh, in support of those individuals who are now captured. Right. Okay, uh, creating bases for education in the community. Uh, themes, uh, themes for education. There should be... Uh, at least three, four times a, uh, a year, uh, major demonstrations in the community on a particular theme uh, of empowerment. Uh, you know, we have to be very creative uh, in, in terms of political activity in, 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 our, in our community. And uh, due to the level of repression, due to the level of, of uh, um, the government trying to thwart any efforts uh, to politicize uh, our people. Uh, so in, in our own creativity, uh, we, we need to uh, create themes, uh, um, uh, levels of, uh, of uh, community activity, right? whether it be block parties, uh, parades, demonstrations, um, that put people in the streets, that galvanize uh, 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 a level of consciousness mm -hmm. that they are in commune with uh, concerning uh, those conditions that they're they're affected by. Right. I like what's going on in New York City in terms of uh, uh, the struggle against crap, right? Mm -hmm. The level of drugs in, in the community and right? people getting involved with that. But that's good. That's good. Uh, um, the political issue involved in that. You must educate right. people. There must be education in terms of where the drugs come from, how it comes into to the community, the economic conditions in terms of drugs, the economic... The drugs in, in our community, basically what we say, what we call illegitimate capitalism, right, is, is a network of, of uh, um, what we call, I, I call it a safety net, right, in the community, an uh, economic safety net in the community, okay, whereby where there are no jobs, okay, and there are no programs for the training and development of new um, where French mm -hmm. economics have destroyed most of those type of programs. Right. All right. So then, what we have is that uh, a level of uh, unemployment and uh, disenfranchisement. So now the government is just infiltrated with uh, drugs and a, a whole uh, subculture of uh, uh, economics, which generates a safety net. Uh, it, it feeds a lot of people. There's no question about it. It does feed, but it also destroys. Yeah. Okay, and I think the, the, the detriment is greater than, than what any good it does. Alright, so community activists, in terms of what needs to be done in community, in terms of taking away the drugs, taking away that the subculture of uh, uh, economic, right, the criminal mentality, must put something in place thereof, okay? Mm -hmm. And so therefore they must involve the community in maybe developing co-op programs uh, for economic development. Uh, you know, so that although you take away the drugs, you put in something in a place that better serves uh, a, another development of, of a culture that is more progressive and, and revolutionary. Mm -hmm. So that, that's my message, you know, if there was to be a message uh, to political activists out there now. Uh, they must get involved in, in, with the community, okay. community events and, and, and create cultural foundations uh, from which education is, is fine. Uh, raise the consciousness of the youth and get the mothers and fathers involved as well. You know, it's important. You know, we got a church on every corner. Right? We need to have a, a political organization alongside that church as well. Right. Okay. You know, so that the, when, they, when they come out of the church, they go right into the political organization. They'll take the spirit of uh, freedom, right? the spirit that they believe in, right? and make it an active type of uh, movement within our community. Mm -hmm. It's important. Well, that's a very good advice. Um, my second to last question. What can we do to support the New York Three? What can people do to support them? <laughs> um, I need uh, 
I missed a chance. Uh, what we need to do is, is we need to develop several issues, several things we need to do. One, we need, there's no question about it, we need support, right? We need public support, we, mm -hmm. we need national support, right? Um, but that support needs need to transcend into education, okay? We need to educate people as to who the New York Three uh, and what do they represent? Why are they in prison? Right. I, I think when people understand everything else becomes easy. Uh, so that, that's the first point. Getting across the message, putting the message out to, to the public. Let them understand that we are not terrorists. We're not crazies. Right. Uh, our interest in, in terms of what we represent has been an interest of communities to support the development of our community and the aspirations of, of black people in this country. Um, Again, we need an amnesty campaign for political prisoners. Right? We need people to cry for the release of those individuals who have been victims of COINTELPRO, and in our case, who have been victims of new kill. Mm -hmm. right? uh, that, in all substance, needs to be uh, manifest right? through political activism right? and those individuals who are concerned. You know? um, there are questions in terms of uh, the quality of life that we confronted with inside prison. So, in that respect, there may be a need for a letter drive campaign to the governor, right? Mm -hmm. um, to inform him that we do not like what's going on inside these prisons as it affects uh, the New York Three, other political prisons in the state of New York. Right? Um, and also, you know, we have thought about having a clemency, uh, uh, trying to fight for clemency. Right, uh, a computation of our sentence due to uh, learning that our case is uh, critical, uh, that we did not receive a fair trial, that mm -hmm. there are thousands of pages and documents that were the defense during the course of our trial, and one uh, particular uh, document. They said that a weapon, they claimed to be my weapon, right, uh, the murder weapon, right, FBI ballistics test says that that is not the murder weapon. Right. All right. This is a document that the DA had during the course of trial that didn't was not turned over to the defense. Right. We knew that this was not the weapon, right. but we cannot prove, and we tried to. Matter of fact, we, we tried to prove uh, in court that documents had been altered, right? Uh, but we didn't have papers to do so. All right. So we have through Freedom of Information Act received thousands and pages of documents that indicates to what degree the federal government was involved in this case that was covered up. And um, we need that information to be brought to the public. Um, we brought to the attention of uh, uh, state representatives and legislators uh, so that they would know of the existence of public prisoners in, 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 uh, in New York. And uh, the whole question of Resisting political prisoners need to be raised throughout the entire country. You know, as mentioned before, a document has been presented to the United Nations. The Commissioner of, uh, of International Jurists has made that statement. At one time, Andrew Young, who was a uh, uh, UN representative, ambassador mm -hmm. to the United Nations, had stated publicly that he believed that there exists in the United States possibly thousands of political prisoners. Um, so that needs to be done. We need letter writing campaigns. We need support in terms of communicating uh, what we represent. I think if that was done, uh, we would win this case. Uh, as maybe you know, we will soon be going into trial, we're going into uh, the federal court on the, a petition for a new trial. Uh -huh. uh, during the last 17 years, well, last, since our conviction in 1975, there has not been one court that provided a hearing as to what happened in our case. Right? We have not had a hearing as to the new information that we have and to what happened in our case. They refused to give us a hearing. So uh, we now go into federal court and hope to win a hearing. Uh, hopefully we'll be submitting our papers within the next couple of months. Probably by the time this, uh, this is aired. And uh, we would ask, again, as much support as we possibly can from all those who would uh, view this, this tape. 
uh, trying to influence the courts to grant us a hearing, um, for, for us to bring our issues into the courtroom. Mm -hmm. I am convinced if we were to bring our issues to the courtroom, that we will convince any court in the country that we did not get a fair trial, uh, a fair and an impartial trial, and that the issues that we are bringing to the court would ultimately gain our release from prison. Mm -hmm. So, we need support of the people. Bye. Okay, um, my last question um, refers to your name, Jalil. Jalil. Uh, you said before that you, you started using that name as you came uh, into okay. the... Okay. Um, I adopted the name uh, Jalil Adumotakin, right? And it's due to uh, uh, adhering to an Islamic uh, uh, faith, right? Uh, the name came about by meeting uh, Rap Brown, okay, uh, who was in my, at a time who was known to as be a leader uh, in the movement. He had since become a Muslim. Mm -hmm. uh, we were in uh, Old Queens together after he had been arrested in October of uh, 72, October 72, October 71 when he was arrested. And we was in Old Queens together. And he and I got a heated debate in terms of politics and religion and so forth. And uh, he basically convinced me that religion is a very important aspect to one's um, growth and development as a human being. Mm -hmm. And uh, I adopted the, the, the faith and thereby changed my name in accordance thereof. Um, do you know what it means in Arabic? Yes. <laughs> it means... Uh, uh, it says, Majestic Servant of God and uh, the Avenger. And the Avenger. And, uh, yeah. Next. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, 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 Rap Brown changed his name to Jamil uh, Abdul uh, Alameen, which a beautiful servant of God and truthful. Uh, 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 well, I think it's important that, for instance, you know, African people and right, uh, uh, our history, we had names that represented uh, or had an attribute, represented a character, right? And what it, what, it, what it does, it provided a sense of identity in, in terms of who you are, right? Uh, we know that in history, that when African people were brought to this country, that we were taking away our African names and given names of our slaveholders, slave masters, right? So, in terms of culture, it separates us from the dominant culture of our oppressor or dominant cultures of the mm -hmm. history of those who have oppressed us. Mm -hmm. uh, so changing name and taking on an attribute is, is trying to live in according to an idea uh, and as a human being that you to represent in spirit. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> thank you very much. That's okay. an interesting Listen, uh, I mean, that's scared to death, but <laughs> it was a pleasure. No, it was great. It was great. <laughs> What would you say to black youth? Like you in this hmm? yeah. uh, uh, my my uh, statement to black youth would basically be the same statement that their parents would, would tell them, uh, um, to the most part, and that would be to stay in school, and not give all the drugs. But also, from my own personal experience, I would ask them to get involved in politics to get involved in the, the development of what goes on inside the community. Mm -hmm. um, that's educational in many respects. Instead of hanging out on the corner and uh, talking jive, right, uh, I would say uh, get involved in some type of organization, some type of group, um, so that you will become responsible individual, not only to yourself, but to the community at, at large. Right? It's important for the youth because the youth is indeed our, our future. Right. So, when I was in high school, right, I was involved in, in black, black uh, uh, student union. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, involved in trying to help other students in the black student union uh, in, 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 in the high school that I was involved in, right, in the high school in my particular district. Okay. 16 years old, I was arrested, yeah, but, you know, when I'm saying that you should go out and get arrested, I'm not saying that. <laughs> but what I am saying is that 
that there's a level of participation in which you can help mm -hmm. and, and, and help them out with their own problems. And in so doing, you help yourself. Okay, you become more mature. Uh, um, yeah, you don't get the kind of problems from your parents because uh, if they believe in what you're doing, then their master is going to support you in that. Um, and then you, you get a level of recognition in, in your own community. You know, uh, you know, when you look at certain groups, and you know, it's one organization that I don't know to what extent they are really, uh, really we have a commitment towards our community, but first you get someone like the Guardian Angels, right? Um, there should be youth organizations in our own community uh, that will guard our community, that will look out for the welfare of the younger uh, in our community, you know, uh, based upon their own leadership. You know, if, if there's such thing as, as a Boy Scouts and the Cub Scouts, then there should be, at, at our time, uh, uh, maybe a youth half the cub, cubs or something like that, you know, <laughs> in, in, our in our community, you know, so that uh, they will be organized in, in, in terms of what are the needs of you in our community, you know. Uh, at one time, when I was growing up, we had a, uh, um, a teen disco, okay, uh, that we used to frequent, okay. Uh, but in terms of what was going on in terms of the disco, right, um, <coughs> It was, most of the individuals there was those individuals who were involved in what's going on in the community. But it was where we went to relax after we took care of business in the community. Right. All right. So we need to put entertainment, make entertainment as part of the development of what goes on inside the community. So cultural events, those type of things are, are important to right. be maintained. And a lot of those things can be sponsored by youth, you know, because they know they, they, they're into, you know, some of the rap music, it's good, you know. Some mm -hmm. of it's good. Some of it has a message. Okay. Yeah, well. So you know, taking the message of the rap and making it real, all right? Making it a living thing. Is what you should be about, you know. Um, taking those economic dollars um, that come from the rap music and putting it back into the community uh, to support the endeavors that youth themselves uh, organize. You know, in terms of cultural development and educational development and uh, you know helping the elderly you know uh, is something that youth can get involved with right old buildings rehabilitating the, uh, old buildings right um, you know what's that means when Ray and took the, those those dollars out of our community those poor people out of the community if he hurt anybody at all I like help hurt the elderly and he hurt the youth yeah. okay you know, especially in terms of programs that were developed for you, see the programs and so forth. Right. All right. So where now those programs no longer exist, it is important that the youth band together themselves for what they know are their needs. I still have one more question. Fire away. I'm just curious about whether there's one thing in the show that you remember that was particularly that was particularly offensive to from the badge of assassin. I don't know when you saw it a long time ago. It's just a one thing to do. Particularly offensive. Or particularly funny. Is there one thing you can remember? <laughs> <laughs> um, badge of assassin. The, the, the movie, I think the whole What they said was a party after these officers uh, had been murdered, and they said that we delighted in, the, in, in, in that killing, right? Um, saying that we were really responsible for it and delighted in it, which is not true. Um, I think that was offensive to me, right? Uh, you know, I made this statement, I make it very plain. The loss of life on, on any capacity is horrendous, okay? I don't care where it comes from. Uh, I do not support killing, period, by no means, from either side. Uh, so therefore, 
for me to accept the betrayal of Badger Assassin and the so-called party uh, after that, that particular incident, after that event. Um, it kind of tears at the spirit, right? It, it tears away from what, if it, you know, what happened, right? What it was supposed to represent, and indeed, that was what it was supposed to represent, right? And to what they showed in that, in that, in that program, that particular scene, right, was uh, terrible. Mm -hmm. It was offensive. Um, the courtroom drama was uh, was offensive. You know, uh, when that woman uh, stood up and uh, did a little wiggle act, and uh, they showed us laughing in, in the courtroom and that kind of thing. That's, that didn't happen. Okay. Uh, yeah. And then she did a little wiggle act in the courtroom. Right. That happened. Right. But us sitting in the courtroom laughing and joking about, you know, that, that's, that's not what happened. Um, the whole courtroom drama was in itself, although it, for the most part, stayed true to the transcript, right, to the court transcript, the betrayal of it was, it's more Hollywood than actual situation. Sure. Yeah. The film, it kept uh, showing retrials and retrials, you know? Yeah. Remember that? Where yeah. at first, oh, they, it looked like they won, and then, you know, I mean, was... Well, it was two trials. Right, there was two trials. The first trial ended in a hung jury. And the, um, I mean, for instance, there's, there's no evidence whatsoever against, um, no, the job of Washington. There's no physical evidence, there's no eyewitnesses, there's no material evidence, there's nothing. Right? Uh, they say it's conspiracy, and they got him convicted. Two other people who were involved in the case, uh, Taurus Brothers, uh, mm -hmm. had during the same amount of evidence and they was dismissed from the uh, from the case. Right? No by by no part of the imagination, sense of the imagination should have been convicted in this case. Right? Um, in terms of myself and, and, and Herman, um, what happened with Reuben Scott, he having been tortured and I am gonna tell you the man was tortured. Right? Uh, he had uh, needles uh, put in his testes, had cattle prods placed on his body. He was beaten for five days. Um, he was a wreck when I got finished with him. He was going to say anything they wanted them to say. All right. um, and knowing the individual, because right, he was a party member, right, he would not be able to stand the type of pressure that was placed upon him. You, know, you could not see that in the movie. But it was not indicated in the movie. It wasn't indicated in, in the movie how these women was threatened um, with the loss of their children. Right. Uh, how they didn't want to testify. Uh, you didn't want to be, have anything to do with this case. How they had actually escaped uh, uh, at one time. Uh, and then was captured and uh, put back in prison and then was made a deal, right, which right. amounted to uh, most of them, receiving the children, housing, clothing, uh, weekly stupids, right. uh, money, and, uh, and the whole bit. So th there's things that happened in that trial that the movie just could not represent, did not represent, it didn't you know, and uh, the, the evidence that was, the evidence, again, like the evidence they said was against me, uh, the weapon, all right? If we had these these documents during the course of trial, mm -hmm. we would have been able to indicate how that particular weapon was not the murder weapon. Right. FBI ballistic test indicated it was not the murder we weapon. But we had New York City Police Department uh, get on trial and fabricate uh, through ballistic tests, they claim, ballistic tests, that it was actually a murder weapon. Mm -hmm. so, uh, and that, and also the level of involvement of uh, the federal government uh, in this case indicated they wanted to get somebody right, to, to knock them off of this, of this case because uh, it, it shocked the nation. And let me tell you why it shocked the nation. May 19th, um, two officers were shot. Right? 
Um, this is the case was Yoruba Moore had been convicted for. All right? And I can say that he is wrongly convicted for, for that particular case. Right? He had been a victim of COINTELPRO because he was a, a deputy minister of uh, information for the New York, New York branch of that kind of party. So they had been, he was also a member of, of uh, 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 the uh, New York 21 case, uh, Track 21 case. Okay. Um, they had went underground uh, due to that case. So he was a hundred individual. So they tried him for that. Right? That's May 21st. And then May, May, that was May 19th. And then May 21st was the case from which we were uh, convicted for. But that was the first time uh, in those two cases, those two instances, that a communique was sent to the news media uh, exclaiming responsibility for those incidents under the name of the Black Liberation Army. So that's the first time the name Black Liberation, Black Liberation Army was known in the United States, right, uh, on the basis of, of a particular incident. Therefore, uh, it brought on the whole of the federal government investigative bureaus to find out who were and are uh, the Black Liberation Army. So this is the, the May 26th meeting at the White House in New Kill investigation and the, the entire cover-ups that had happened okay, uh, on, on the basis of, of this case. So that, that's the importance um, of this case and why they were so desperate in trying to get someone uh, convict someone uh, as to the responsibility of the, of the death of those, uh, those officers, uh, BLA. Yeah. I think I have another question. Can you survive it? Sure. <laughs> and this, uh, and this uh, comes to me, uh, I think the last question. I'm just curious, I think that it's hard for people for it to be real, being in prison for people. So I'm wondering if there's some single memory you have when you first hit this prison that brought home to you that you were in prison and uh, yeah, that it was me in Hawaii. Or just what the first sort of association when you came in. Oh, before we start, let me, let me, let me. Jail and prison, all right? Jail is, jail is part of prison, all right? So, Jail does not have the type of, well, let's say jail does have the type of uh, physical experience that prison has, okay? So, having been in jail, prison does not really give me the type of, uh, uh, you know, profound... No, 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 I've never been, okay? But, prison does this, it separates you from family and from their community and it, and, and it is that separation that is uh, that's profound you know. uh, yeah I, I, say, I can say something about prison there's no question about it uh, yeah. especially if there's some single incident that you can remember a single incident that I can remember? yeah but also things you can say okay you gonna raise the question again or? Uh, okay, uh, so what was, uh, um, how has, uh, what's the single incident, is there any single incident that could be, that's what holds the reality of being in prison? Okay, uh, prison does this, it dehumanizes, it takes away a person's self-being. One thing you know when you come to prison is this. They make you strip all your clothes and they search all your body cavities. All your body cavities. Okay? And any man who has to expose himself uh, to another individual uh, to determine whether or not he has what they call contraband uh, is dehumanizing in, in, a, in a, of itself. So it strips you of your own personhood. The second thing is that it takes away your relationship. It is it 
in. It makes it difficult relationships of any kind, uh, personal relationships, uh, human relationships that you have with your family. Okay, it, it creates a separation uh, from family and community. But then it also it does it, if a person is married or have a, a girlfriend, right, uh, a woman that he's in love with. It makes that relationship very, very, very difficult. It, 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 it tears at it. You know, if you got years in prison. You know. Because what happens is that she is doing time with you. You know. Although she's in the streets, right? Or the family's in the streets, right? They are doing time with you. If they love you, they're doing time with you. Okay. And each time they come into these facilities, they have to go through a dehumanizing process of entering the facility. They gotta take off medals and jewelry and be searched, um, you know, sign papers uh, for identification, and then come into the visiting room and expect you to come down with a smile on your face at every visit. And sometimes it doesn't happen. Sometimes you come down and you're angry uh, because you're hurting inside. You don't want to be here. And so it takes a toll on the relationships. You know, uh, she feels, you know, that she tries her time, her day to come to be with her man or her husband, her mother or her son. And she also feels that anguish. Like, why am I suffering because you are suffering? All right. So prison does that. It does not only make the individual inside suffer. It also makes the family suffer. Makes the loved ones suffer. So if, if there was any one thing that hurt me most in terms of me being in prison, it was my mother and family members and my daughter having to come see me. I, I remember one time where uh, I had not seen my daughter in a very long time. Time. Uh, I think I haven't seen her in about almost four or five years. And not having been on the streets with her, uh, she came to see me when I was in Auburn. And uh, I think she was 11 years old. So I haven't seen her in about five, maybe longer, years. And uh, she came in the visiting room, she's tall now, you know. Because last time I seen her, she was a, a midget, <laughs> a dwarf. And uh, she says, uh, she told me, she started crying. I says, why are you crying? She says, uh, because I love you, right? I haven't seen you in so long. She said, everybody can see you crying. She says, I don't care, right? And uh, she said, now I know where I came from. And what that told me is that she had doubt as to who her father was. And that, like, kind of, you know, so uh, that's 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 what's uh, that's what eats me up now. Uh, it's, it's being separated from her. And, uh, and she'll be 16 uh, March uh, 21st. Uh, and uh, she's 16, huh? <laughs> and uh, you know, I'm not there. Okay. That's what tears us apart: separation of families and loved ones. What is it, uh, any particular one? Um, just sort of them in general. Uh, yeah, and if I had known it, I would have brought out a shopping bag for them. <laughs> <laughs> All coin tail pro documents. That's right. Stuff that we didn't have going across the trial. So if you wanted to, you could either explain them or you might want to point out a few. Um, uh, okay. Let me point out a couple. Name. Like perhaps the um the bill. The bill? Think so? Hey. Do you have an extra copy by any chance? I'd well, love to see it. Read it if possible. I can send it to you. I can send you a copy. Yeah? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. I send you a copy of that and you feel things. That'd be great. You can just send it to Paper Tiger with my name on it.
for instance, when we talk about nuclear and co pro documents, uh, you know, I like to point out to what degree the, the federal government was involved in this case. For instance, here's, here's a document here that at the top, right here, is a, says White House on it, right? It's a White House memorandum. And uh, it's to the director, who was at the time um, Diego Hoover, from John Ehrlichman, uh, who was the domestic advisor to the president uh, during Nixon's administration. Another document uh, with Ehrlichman's name on it here. All right, uh, Ehrlichman's name right at the top, my right dear Mr. Ehrlichman, um, was sent to him by um, J. Edgar Hoover right, in, regards, in regards to the matters involved in, in this case. So, you know, it, it, it basically indicates to what level the federal government was involved uh, in, in the case and uh, the, the level of communication back and forth between mm -hmm. the two. When we talk about cover-ups, um, for instance, I, I just like to read something from, from this particular document here, which is a memorandum, um, and it says background information about the Bureau's investigation concerning the killing of two New York City police officers on 52171. This investigation was initiated pursuant to the request by President Nixon, made of the Bureau on 52671. That's when they had that meeting, White House meeting. And pertinent results of this investigation were made available to New York City Police Department VA letterhead memorandums, which is called LHMs. Uh, and then further on down in, in here, it says, We queried the New York office, federal office, uh, uh, FBI office, as to whether any of the information furnished to the defense attorneys originated from the FBI, and whether it could be clearly identified as such. New York office, after contact with local authorities in New York, determined that the LHMs made available to the police by the Bureau concerning this matter were not turned over to defense, nor could the information furnished to defense attorneys be clearly identified as originating from those LHMs. To date, there is no apparent indication that the defense attorneys may make a similar motion concerning information concerning the Bureau of Files relative to the investigation of New Kill. One of the pertinent documents in terms of not being or was covered up, right? Not handed over to the defense and the FBI informing uh, those involved that was not uh, furnished was a document uh, regarding uh, a weapon that they claimed to have been mined, uh, the, the murder weapon. If I see if I can find a copy of that document here. Um, what's important about it is that. The doc FBI ballistic test, oh, I can't seem to find that now. Says that FBI ballistic test indicates the weapon was not or could not be determined as being the actual murder weapon. So how old were you when you were arrested? Nineteen years old. And when when, when did you I was born 10, 1851, uh, October. 18, 1951. And when, when will you be able to have parole and be out? If, <laughs> if, we do not, if we're not successful in the court, right. Right, then uh, my first pro appearance, pro board appearance, uh, will not be until 2002. Uh, and that's what, another uh, 10 more years, 12 more years, oh. something like that. So. Uh, 14. Yeah, a little 14 or 14 more years. So that's that's the situation, right? I should be a well matured <laughs> man by that time. Yeah, if that should happen. But uh -huh. I, I, I am, I am, we're supporting the people, right? we're supporting the, the community. Um, you know, I still have faith. I still believe in, in the power of the people. With that power, right, I, we could be out of prison in, in 18 months with the power of the people, you know. So, you know, I believe, I, I'm, I'm very convinced that we, if the federal government will grant us a hearing in the federal court, that we will be released from prison. But again, it, it depends upon the power of the people. Sure. You know, they are the influence, they are the motivators of history. Yep. People. Okay. And uh, so that's where my faith lies.
Okay. And a hope for God. Right. Yep. <laughs> um, so this document that we cut off. Should we show it? Do we need to show it? Better to do more than you don't have to use it. Do more than less. If you feel, if there's anybody you feel like you shouldn't, but in terms of taping, if, if there we should do it. That's, you know, that's what you I think the lawyer's probably be upset with me. Yeah. Oh, yeah? Okay, good. Okay, so no, that's good. Well, he probably wants to do this himself. Okay, that's fine. All right, see, see what, what he has to say. All right. You ready? And, and yet, here's uh, another document, a uh, new kill document, uh, pertaining to the, the cover-up. And this memorandum speaks specifically to the weapon that they claim to have been mined or had been used, right? And it says here, no identification, 45 caliber bullet we are uh, holding can be made, right? And there's other... And there, are, there are other uh, nuclear documents that expressly determines there's no manner from which they would, can conclusively determine that the 45 caliber weapon um, they claim to have been mined and the murder weapon was the actual uh, weapon used in this case. <laughs> and, you know, when we look at the, 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 the volume of over 10, and in, 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 in this case, uh, you know, I was just thinking myself, I think I had something like almost 10,000 pages. Uh, several thousand pages, several thousand pages of documents mm -hmm. in, in my cell uh, that were in, in the hands of the district attorney during the course of the trial and that the defense knew nothing thereof. Okay. In terms of... Uh, uh, mm -hmm the level of federal involvement in this case and what the uh, the DA was to use as his uh, means to obtain a conviction. If this information was brought to the, to the attention of a juror, uh, we're convinced that we would not have been convicted. You know, there's no way they can convict us. Not only because of what the, the uh, documents represent, but going to the atmosphere and climate of the country at the time and that was being committed against uh, party members, like the anti party members. And so, and they understood the politics that was involved during that, that particular time, that era in the United States history. So, if we was able to prove, if we were able to prove that we were uh, being uh, the federal government was involved in this case to the level that it was, and we was able to show that to the uh, uh, to the jurors, we would have been uh, uh, naturally acquitted of this case. Uh, I think it's important also to take note of the fact that during the course of the trial, attorneys had made motion to bring up the issues of um, COINTELPRO, and the, and the judge denied it. He said, in effect, that we did not have any proof that we were victims of COINTELPRO. The truth of the matter is that we did not have the proof, the DA had all the proof. Uh. So, that's how we lost the case. That's how we got convicted. Uh, it was, the, the, let's put it this way, the, the prosecutor and the judge and the entire federal government were stacked up against us and our defense. And the issues that we want to raise in terms of defending ourselves, we're prohibited, prevented from doing so due to the fact we could not bring concrete proof of to what degree the federal government was involved in this case. That was withheld. That was what to cover up. Documents involved in that cover up. And it's, if people was to be, was to learn of this, right, know, know to what degree um, the cover-up existed and what happened. I think they would be even surprised to learn that the federal government would go to such extremes. Really? Uh, yeah. You know. I was surprised about that. Yeah, okay, to go to such extremes to put people in prison. Uh, to make an example, right, to, to prevent uh, a, 
Let's stop the movement. I don't know if they would be surprised, uh, considering what happened in Vietnam and what continues to go on in Latin America and other parts of the world. But domestically, they may be surprised today as to what happened in the 60s and the 70s. You know, uh, there's a lot of things that happened that people do not know today. And there are people in prison who are victims uh, of government repression during that time. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's important. That's important. Uh, you also asked about, you was asking about um, my uh, involvement inside prison and things of that nature. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I showed you earlier before it was taken. The bill. If I can say that. Yeah, the bill. But uh, here's a one article that I had printed. This is a publication in uh, Brooklyn called uh, Big Red. Right? And it's an article uh, this, uh, called Title Common Sense in the Prison System. And it was uh, written by me, Big Red. They had it printed. And what it dealt with, the article, deals with some of my work here in Greenhaven. Uh, particularly dealing with uh, a bill that I wrote, a legislative bill that I wrote and um, submitted to the legislature. Right? This is the bill, this is my draft of the bill, right? my writing of the bill. And um, uh, Assemblyman Arthur O.E. picked up on it and submitted it to the, uh, the assembly. And the bill basically deals with the question of, uh, of um, good time issues for those individuals in prison who have spent, who have a maximum sentence of life. Uh, it's called Earned Central Allowance Bill. And currently the bill is, is before um, Daniel Feldman, Assemblyman Daniel Feldman, who is head of the Coast Committee for the Assembly. And we are trying to um, have the bill tabled again because right, it missed the last legislative session, have it tabled again uh, to have a hearing and voted upon. What is particularly concerned here in the state of New York in terms of prisons is this. 80% uh, of all prisoners in the state of New York are black and Hispanic, uh, people of color. Uh, mm -hmm. um, Actually, it's a little more than 80%. But also prisoners, right? And there's now 42,000 prisoners in the state of New York, right? Wow. Uh, 80% of all prisoners come out of New York City and it's environment, right? And it's environment. So basically what you find is that the Department of Corrections service New York City, the criminal justice system of New York City, right? Um, we can look at the population inside prison and know from what communities most of these prisons come from. And then when we look at those communities, we can understand the condition and why they committed acts. Primarily for economic reasons, right? They may have been against the law mm -hmm. and sent to prison. All right. I think it's important to, to, to take this note, right? The 13th Amendment of the United States Constitution, as many of us know, was supposedly to abolish slavery in the United States. Its primary goal and objective was to abolish slavery in the United States, right? It says, neither slavery nor voluntary servitude shall exist in the United States uh, except for those who have been duly convicted of a crime. So what we find is that slavery had not been abolished in the United States, but rather has been institutionalized. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then when we look at the colors of people who are predominant in prison, we see a mechanism, right, uh, uh, a new form, neo-slavery, the system represents. Uh, it's also important in terms of New York State is, uh, to take note of the fact that Governor Cuomo, in his little more than four years of, of, of uh, the four years of being an administrator, uh, governor, this, has built more prisons, have had more prisons built than any other governor in the uh, history of this, the state. All right? um, they have an expectation to have 50,000 people in prison by 19, 
90, right, which are predominantly black and uh, Hispanic. Uh, so what we are learning is that due to economics, it has created conditions in which more people are being sent to prison due to crimes uh, of economic significance. Right? And those individuals who come to prisons are predominantly black and Hispanic. Uh, we must take note of the fact that most of the people who run prisons are white Americans, mm -hmm. right? And in this case, uh, upstate, rural white Americans. Mm -hmm. Well, Governor Cuomo has failed to bring to the state new industry. He has created an industry out of the prison system. And now hires more people. He gives more service uh, contract jobs than any other industry in the state of New York. The state of New York prison industry is a two billion dollar industry. Okay. What we should take note of is that much of that money do not return back into the community in which most of these prisons come from. You understand what I'm saying? So we, we are we have a problem. Uh, in terms of trying to change the conservative atmosphere that is uh, prevailing in the state of New York uh, in regards to prisons and the criminal justice system. It is my hope right, that this bill uh, will service that to some degree. Uh, we're, we're trying to create a new prison movement, a uh, new penal reform uh, movement in the state of New York part of the activities that I'm involved in now. And um, if we can do that, uh, then not only will it, it, it help change conditions inside prisons, but it will give the community a sense of understanding of how the criminal justice system operates uh, in their community. Right? When they see the police um, cruising in the community, the back end of that that cruising, that, that police car, is mm -hmm. a prison cell. Right. Okay? When we recognize that there are something like 30,000 uh, homeless people in the state of New York, all right, 30,000 in, in the state of New York, homeless people, per, per, most of them in New York City, right? And $150,000 per cell to build one cell, $150,000.